Welcome to the PI Podcast, Political Insights for the Palaging Inis. I'm your host, Matt, and with me is my co-host, political scientist, Meme Lord, with a new OnlyFans account where you you can send him philosophy books and he'll see if it fits bored. No. <laughs> fits where? Fits in my bookshelf. Fits in, in my bookshelf. Framework. <laughs> in my framework. Fair, fair, fair. Pia yeah. <laughs> nyo, pia nating lahat, bored here at your service. And yes, this is uh, episode, uh, what episode is it again? We are in 18. Uh, 18. 18. Wow. We are, uh, in, it's our debut now. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're legal. We're legal. All right. It's been a long time. And I, honestly, this episode is a bit special uh, because for one thing, uh, this is actually uh, based on a request from a, an, an avid listener, uh, Andre Trinidad. Uh, and he actually, uh, he's enjo- he enjoys a lot of our episodes. Uh, so oh, thank great. you for listening. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to us to deal with a topic close to his art because he's also... Uh, He's based in Seattle, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and a Filipino there. But also, he notices that Filipinos are actually also quite active. But sometimes, um, perhaps, he wants to add, uh, he, he's wondering it, whether or not it's overstepping boundaries as someone who is abroad but and not really having any stake in the uh, political affairs here. Mm. And so, uh, we thought that we might explore that, you know, in, in a way, in between being a Filipinos being in between two countries, you know. Any thoughts, j- thoughts in general, Borg, before we get into our special guest? Mm. Yeah. Well, I think we need to examine the nature of the boundary itself. So, how mm-hmm. far can a tie last? So, I think that would be one of our main questions. Uh, why do mm-hmm. Filipino citizenship or sense of citizenship uh, can survive in a foreign land? Mm-hmm. So, because there are yeah. a lot of Filipinos in well in other countries we are everywhere but mm-hmm. in America in particular especially based on our last uh, episode 5 and yeah 5.5 uh, we talked about American politics and really the Philippine presence there I think we're the third largest foreign well Filipino is the third largest uh, I think so. Foreign language spoken. So we can also double check with our guest speaker because he is actually not only is he a dual citizen himself as a Filipino living in America, but he's actually quite a bit of a, a literal encyc- a human encyclopedia. So let me just start by introducing uh, one of my oldest friends. Uh, I, I actually talked to him about this uh, topic. Uh, he is. Well, I, I've known him since high school, actually, and he is the person, one of the people that. I'm uh, is one of the reasons why I'm in political science in the first place. If you remember my origin story, so it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> and we were all we've known each other for like four years in the debate club in uh, high school, and even we were even uh, blockmates in Ateneo de Manila. And mm. now he is, uh, I suppose, he's a community manager at Deviant Art. And he has, he's had many jobs, but mainly he's known for being an editor in Wikipedia. So he does that for fun as a hobby. So yeah, mm-hmm. definitely knowledge about a lot of things. Uh, we'll get to know him pretty soon. In fact, um, he was even the among the top Filipino Wikimedia uh, editors. I think he's the co-founder of the Wikimedia Philippines. So mm-hmm. ladies and gentlemen, Maka P.I. Uh, let's give a warm P.I. Welcome to Joshua Lim. Ooh. Hello, Josh. Hi, Matt. Hi, Borge. Thank you yep. so much for having me here today. Maraming salamat rin. Uh-huh. And it's all the way from... Maraming salamat. Where... Matt, you were a bit gratuitous with the intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. It's a special special intro for a special guy. <laughs> for a special... Well, anyway. Uh, so, I want to ask first. Let me start. What is what is it like living in America as a Filipino over there? I'm, and how long have you been doing so? Despite being in Spain, so, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm currently in Spain on vacation, so let's make that very yeah. clear. I'm in Spain on vacation, sure. but there are 160,000, 150, 160,000 Filipinos in Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, so you do see them. But <laughs> in the United States, I actually grew up there. So what happened was I moved to the U.S. when I was nine years old. Um, mm-hmm. Landed first in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we moved to Pittsburgh a few months after landing in Seattle. That was April of 2001. Mm-hmm. And then basically my mom has been there ever since. I have gone back to the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Um, as you know, Matt, because you we mm-hmm. went through high school and college together. Mm-hmm. But I, And then I only came back to the United States in 2018 after landing my job at UPN Dart. So um, I do live in LA, um, mm-hmm. LA, Los Angeles, for those of you who may not know what LA is, 
mm-hmm. is the mecca for Filipinos in lock um, in the United States. So there are four and a half million Americans of Filipino descent. About one million, around one million, one and a half million of those people mm-hmm. live in California. So LA has about um, LA as I think about a million or so. Um, so I, again, I'm getting my numbers probably quite big. I don't know if I'm getting them right or I'm getting them wrong. Mm-hmm. I think actually it's a couple of million. And the reason for that is because there are about a million that live in LA itself. So in mm-hmm. LA and the surrounding metropolitan area, if you throw in San Diego, it's probably going to be a million and a half, maybe higher. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then you have about 800,000 Filipinos, if I am not mistaken, living in the San Francisco Bay Area. So that's why they call Bailey City, which is a city immediately south of the city of San Francisco, Filipino town. Because mm-hmm. all the Filipinos live there. They have a Filipino mayor. They have Filipinos in local government, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And mind mm-hmm. you, 800,000 Filipinos is roughly the number of Filipinos in Canada. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine <laughs> 800,000 Filipinos in a space that is one, what, one one thousand the size of the second largest country in the world. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're going to be particularly politically influential. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these Filipinos, and myself included, tend to be very attuned to what's going on in the Philippines, particularly older generations of Filipinos. So if you look at how Filipinos are in the U.S., um, Mm -hmm. compared to, let's say, other Asian diasporas, a lot Mm -hmm. of Filipinos that do make it to the United States, and this is primarily... To some extent, because of the way that the U.S. immigration system works. So because of um, family um, reunification in the United States, the backlog for visas is quite long. And Mm -hmm. so you will have people whose visas are only being processed now, but Mm -hmm. they were applied for in the mid-1990s. So a lot of these people have lived in the Philippines before they even made it into uh, to the United States. And so a lot of these people are first-generation immigrants. And mm-hmm. so they will continue to be attuned to political goings on in the Philippines. And you mm-hmm. actually have a large chunk of the Filipino diaspora, not just in the U.S., but around the world, that are also very politically active. It only comes to further generations that mm-hmm. tend to be more integrated into their host countries and by by extension, they become less interested Mm -hmm. in political goings on in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. They will care more Mm -hmm. about politics in their home country as opposed to, let's say, what's going on with the Duterte presidency Mm -hmm. or the the political scandal du jour in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the diaspora, because they are first-generation immigrants, they are politically active. They tend to be of the older generation but they are politically active nonetheless. Mm. Mm. And why do you think there is this difference, you know, the first generation diaspora? Like, why, are they, why do they still care as compared to the older generation? Why do you think there's a split? So this is the case, actually, of a lot of diaspora communities. If you think mm-hmm. about it, um, people who are of the first generation, and this is not just the Filipino diaspora, this is any diaspora. Yeah. The first generation immigrants that go to a particular foreign country, they tend to be the least integrated into the countries that are hosting them. Mm -hmm. So these are people who still feel a very strong affinity for their home countries, Mm -hmm. and rightfully so, because they are from there. Mm -hmm. And you actually do have diasporas that actively express a desire, let's Mm -hmm. say with Mm -hmm. the Syrian community, with the Afghan community, with the Somali community, Mm -hmm. that once the political and social situation in their countries of origin improves, they will want to go home. Mm -hmm. So you do have people who actively express in their respective diasporas, Mm -hmm. if the political situation improves and they're not going to be shot to death, Mm -hmm. they will want to go back to their home countries and build their home countries. And Mm -hmm. you actually have people, particularly here in Europe, where you have a very large Syrian, Iraqi, Mm -hmm. uh, Kurdish, uh, etc. diaspora. These are the people that want to go home at Mm -hmm. some point Mm -hmm. in the future and help rebuild their country so that they actually don't see a need to want to leave and go somewhere else to make their money. Mm -hmm. Which, quite interestingly enough, is not really the case of the Filipino diaspora. I notice a lot of the Filipino diaspora, they really want to leave, right? (laughs) Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that a lot of Filipinos feel that the um, the opportunities for them are greater outside of the Philippines and it would be in the Philippines itself. Um, But that being said, the further 
integrated you are into your home uh, into your country that's hosting you the mm-hmm. less likely you are going to be um able to relate to political goings on in mm-hmm. your country of origin second generation immigrants mm-hmm. tend to be the bridge between the country that they are being hosted in and the home country so mm-hmm. for example you're a second generation immigrant your immigrants uh your immigrant parents who are first generation are not particularly integrated into the home country and so as a second generation offspring of first generation immigrants you're the one making it easier for your first generation parents to integrate into the home country you are the mm. one that speaks the native um the native language you are the one that knows the cultural idiosyncrasies of the country that you're living in you're mm. the one who goes to local schools in that area mm-hmm. and so you are the one helping navigate your first generation parents who most likely move to the country as adults they do not know these things and they will mm. probably not have the patience to learn these things right. and so you are the ones bridging that for them when you get to the third generation the fourth generation and so on and so forth these are mm-hmm. people who are detached enough from their home countries that for mm-hmm. them mm-hmm. um identifying with let's say the philippines you're a fourth generation filipino american you're mm-hmm. proud to be a filipino origin but mm-hmm. your home country is the united states mm-hmm. and so you will not feel an affinity for the philippines other than i like kare kare and i can dance <laughs> <with the thing. laughs> because oh these are right because yep. these are things that i am culturally accustomed to these are things that i learned from my elders who happen to be immersed in that culture um but i'm not going to be interested in goings on um politically in a country that is 8000 miles away mm-hmm. and you actually do have instances where subsequent generations of the diaspora are so detached from their home countries that mm-hmm. in fact they've fully assimilated into the countries of host them. So right. you actually do have Filipino Americans mm-hmm. and I know this from personal experience who feel less like they don't really feel Filipino, they really feel mm-hmm. American. And so they're with basically all Americans. the <laughs> Yeah, they're basically Americans. Like I have a Filipino American coworker at Deviant Art. Mm-hmm. He is mm-hmm. I think a third generation Filipino American. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. hates Filipino food and the mm-hmm. only Filipino food that he'll eat is adobo cooked by his wife who's white. Oh. You can imagine. <laughs> oh, that's a, right. You that's can imagine story. where we're going with this, right? All uh, right. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean yeah, can I mean, clearly from your story that there's a I mean Filipinos have no trouble almost integrating, you know, and it ha- they've have integrated so much. And it wasn't always like that. In fact, during the time of Carlos Belosa, you know that Filipinos have been routinely, of course, been racially discriminated, even physically abused, etc. I was wondering if th- yes. they've actually been still traces of that or are there still um there are still obstacles to integration in America especially right now with the uh asian yeah american uh problems right now in the in america if you are i'm aware i'm aware that the both of you know what is going on in the united states and yes the united states like most other countries and actually no the us more than other countries if yeah. i were to say so myself mm-hmm. personally have a lot of things to take care of when mm-hmm. it comes to dealing with the fallout of racial issues. Yes, mm-hmm. I am not going to deny this mm-hmm. because unfortunately a lot of Filipino Americans don't realize this. I, I realize it because I lived outside of the country for so long. So that's why I know these things. Mm-hmm. Filipino Americans and Filipinos in the diaspora have been treated fairly poorly by their countries of origin. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just in the United States. For example, did you know that Filipinos in South Africa were treated yeah. basically as black people because oh. we were dark skinned? And mm-hmm. so a lot of Filipinos in South Africa during apartheid lived in Bantu stands. They lived in the quote unquote reservations designated for black people because Filipinos were black people, oh, right? No. Compared to let's say the Chinese, the Japanese or the Koreans who were given honorary white status. Oh. In the United States, yes, mm. a lot of Filipinos don't realize this that we mm. were and especially recent immigrants because these are things that they do not learn in the school system in the Philippines or elsewhere a lot of filipinos were treated like you know they were treated very terribly mm-hmm. in the early days of um us colonialism basically pre 1945 mm. and you see this 
being perpetuated even in structures today. If you've listened to um, or if you've seen the Vox episode on mm. Filipino nurses, the reason why Filipinos are overwhelmingly represented as frontline nurses in mm. U.S. hospitals is precisely because of imperialist colonial policies that um, encourage Filipinos to become nurses in the United States. And these are things that we are continuing to perpetuate. So if you're looking at examples of how um, I would well, if you're looking at examples of how systemic racism tends to manifest itself in ways that mm. you don't normally realize that they would manifest in, Filipino nurses is definitely one of them. And that's the reason why you have that stereotype that Filipinos are nurses in the United States. Look, I'm going to admit it's certainly better than the stereotype of Filipinos in Europe. In Europe, Filipinos are stereotyped as being maids, mm. except in the UK, <laughs> because a lot of Filipinos are nurses. Mm. But you know, it's not any better that Filipinos are stereotyped as nurses in the United States. And even then, it comes with the concomitant baggage that is attached to that. There's a reason why Filipino nurses die more frequently from COVID than other nurses. Because mm. Filipino nurses are on the front lines, and they're the ones who are most exposed to COVID. And that's just mm. to tie this into the recent pandemic. There are certainly more examples of Filipinos having to deal with current day structural racism mm. and it's not just filipino american lolos and lolas mm. being beaten up mm. um on the streets of san francisco or new york or where have you um and we have and um becoming the next poster child for stop aapi hate there mm. are other instances of filipinos having to deal with structural racism mm. that mm. we don't realize because it doesn't look like it's structural racism. And these are things, particularly for first-generation Filipino immigrants, mm. these are things that we are not particularly taught about in Philippine schools. So we have to keep that in mind. Fascinating. Hmm. So I think they're first-generation immigrants, even if they're suffering such uh, structural racism, they would bring the Filipino value of being resilient. <laughs> exactly. The they yeah. would want to... Exactly. They will bring that um, value of resilience with them because mm. for them, and this is the case of a lot of first generation immigrants, for them, I am sacrificing my happiness for the benefit of my family so that my kids and their kids and their kids and so on and so forth mm -hmm. will benefit from having a better future than the future that I had living in the home country. Right. Mm, yeah. It's come to think of it, it's kind of ironic that they try to leave uh, a hellhole country like the Philippines and yet they are met with racism. So I'm curious though, uh, just to get your opinion on this, but is it still more or less still worth it to leave the Philippines or is it more or less the same? You're just traded with a different set of problems. I'm curious what you think about that. So um, for context of why I left the Philippines, okay. for me, I work in tech, as you know. Mm -hmm. Um Tech can only get you so far in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, if you want to advance in a technical career, you will have no choice but to leave if you are given the option to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way that a lot of technologists end up becoming you know, the big shot technologists that they are in the Philippines mm -hmm. is because they left for a few years probably and then they came back with the money that they earned abroad, with the experience mm -hmm. that they earned abroad. Mm -hmm. And then these are things that they bring with them um, and help inform their experiences in the Philippines and they teach people um, accordingly as a result of that. For me, I'm not really trading if you're looking at if you're looking at it that way, I'm not really trading Philippine problems for foreign problems. I watch Philippine news almost every single day. Mm -hmm. So I am mm -hmm. very aware of goings on in the Philippines. And you know, if you think about it, I may be 30 years old, but I am a first generation immigrant. I moved mm. to the United States, when I was 10, it's not as mm -hmm. if I was a baby and the country that I really knew was the United States. That is not the case for me, mm -hmm. especially having grown up in the Philippines the first nine years of my life mm -hmm. and then returning to the Philippines and living there for another 13 years before coming back to the United States. So if you think about it, that collective experience, I've actually spent more years in the Philippines than I did outside of the Philippines. Mm. And so if you're looking at it that way, especially because I go back to the Philippines every so often, mm -hmm. I am perfectly comfortable commenting about political goings on in the Philippines because I actually know what I'm talking about, yeah. unlike other people. Um, and so uh, I know that the common criticism of Phil Ams is that Phil Ams are just shooting from the hip and they do not know what they're saying when it comes to political goings on in the Philippines. 
the Philippine X issue is one example mm-hmm. of that, right? Yeah. But I would also like to think that Filipino Americans in the diaspora, um, Filipinos in the diaspora generally, not just mm-hmm. Filipino Americans, given that there are 10 million Filipinos outside of the Philippines, they have mm-hmm. every right to comment on what's going on in the country as much as Filipinos in the Philippines do, mm-hmm. simply because they are also very aware right. that Filipinos, um, or rather that whatever the Philippine government does in the Philippines also affects the diaspora. Mm-hmm. Look at what happened with PhilHealth. That mm-hmm. affects the diaspora very much. Of course, you're going to have Filipinos in the diaspora complaining about that, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very... Uh... In fact, it's it's not an easy thing to do to be aware of two countries. But uh, one thing that we want to ask, uh, and we mentioned it a while ago, uh, another personal thing, is that you are a dual citizen. Most people actually just keep one. And yet, there are you belong to a class of people that maintain two citizenships. So can you tell us something about that and why do you remain to, or two citizenships, that have two citizenships? Yeah. So a lot of Filipinos, I, I'm going to be very blunt here. A lot sure. of Filipinos are dual citizens, yes. particularly first-generation immigrants. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of Filipinos remain dual citizens for very pragmatic reasons. I want to own mm-hmm. land in the Philippines. I want to have a business in the Philippines. I want to be able to go to the Philippines as often as I want. Or I mm-hmm. want to retire in the Philippines mm. and I want to do so in a country where I will feel more comfortable than if I were to retire in the US or mm-hmm. in Canada or mm. in Spain or where have you, right? right? Um, mm-hmm. And this is particularly the case with Filipinos in countries where they are allowed to naturalize. So you don't see a lot of dual citizens in the Middle East, for example, simply because the barrier to naturalization for Filipinos in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain, in Qatar, in mm-hmm. where have you, is quite high. But mm. you do see large concentrations of dual citizens in the US, in Canada, in Australia, in Spain, in the UK, where have you, because the barrier to entry for those um, for those Filipinos becoming citizens in their host countries mm. is much lower than mm. in other places where you'll find Filipinos. Mm. So I'm going to be quite blunt here. The mm. majority of Filipinos do so for very pragmatic reasons. But at the same time, I would imagine you do have a subset of Filipinos. I don't know how big they are. I'm probably counted into the subset simply mm. because I'm talking to you guys right now. Mm-hmm. that you do have people who still remain interested in wanting to exercise their voice in the yeah. realm of Philippine politics. And so these right. are the people who continue to vote in Philippine elections. Mm-hmm. These are the people who continue to organize the diaspora in order to show support for a particular political candidate. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. You really think that there were no Duterte supporters in the U.S.? Of course there are. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and these are, <laughs> yeah. And they organize people voting for him in the 2016 presidential election. So these are definitely, um, this is definitely a thing because you are only able to fully exercise your political rights in the Philippines if you have reacquired dual citizenship. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you are consequently a citizen of both your host country and the Philippines because the Philippines does not um, make illegal the possession of multiple citizenships. Right. That is a way for you to continue influencing your um your voice um significant stakes in philippine businesses mm-hmm. um which will be important for you when you build your nest egg when you retire yeah mm. yeah i do yeah. agree with that one since that's also the goal of my parents currently live in canada right now so the, they're, they're keeping their citizenship <laughs> uh-huh. so they can retire here uh-huh. so they're gunning for citizenship there because mm-hmm. one thing I want to state here at this point is that, of course, this is an example of citizenship being a part of set of rights, the right to own land, right to enter, right to uh, a lot of things, right to own business, etc. But one thing that we want, we need to highlight here is that, as what Josh already mentioned, is that citizenship is also about uh, responsibilities and duties, you know, like voting, like organizing and politically participating. So the next question is, and perhaps you can uh, talk about what you have observed in the Philippine diaspora, as well as perhaps your own politics. Like how do the dual citizens, or how do Filipinos continue to uh, balance that participation in both uh, the countries, you know, in America and in Philippine politics? I mean, I can only speak to the United States because it's sure. the only country mm. that I have really, um, that I have really observed. 
right. um, in that sense. But, you know, keep in mind that you have Filipinos in the diaspora who mm-hmm. are active in host country politics. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why we have Filipinos who are mayors, who are councillors, who are state legislators. Mm-hmm. The most recent Filipino person that I can think of that achieved statewide office is Attorney General Rob Banta of California, mm-hmm. where he is Filipino and he um, won the election uh, well, he was named Attorney General, and he will probably run again in the 2022 election. Granted, however, Fanta is a third-generation Filipino-American, mm. so he's probably not the best example that I can think of. Mm-hmm. But you do have, um, particularly for first-generation Filipino-Americans, mm-hmm. um, they do express very colorful opinions of politics <laughs> in their host countries, as well as very colorful opinions in the Philippines. I will say colorful because in the United States, while Asian Americans as a whole um, were supportive of Joe Biden in the 2020 presidential election, there are three major um, Asian American groups that um, had a large minority of people voting for Donald Trump and trending towards the Republican Party for various reasons. Mm-hmm. These are, yeah, exactly. These are the Vietnamese, the mainland Chinese, and the mm-hmm. Filipinos. And I will tell you why Filipinos trend. Um, you have Filipinos that trend Republican. It's because it um, they appeal. The Republicans appeal to the social conservatism, particularly of many first generation Filipino mm. immigrants. So they like that you know, oh, um, the Republicans are against abortion. They like that the Republicans are against marriage. Like that the Republicans um, uh, advocate for um, the rights of churches and so on and so forth. So uh, these are things that appeal. To the politics of first-generation Im- Filipino immigrants, um, as they try to juxtapose their first their home country politics into something that meshes well with the belief systems that they will encounter in their host countries, that's actually the case of a lot of Filipino, um, not just Filipino Americans or uh, mm-hmm. Filipinos in the diaspora, but with the diaspora in general. If you are um, inculcated with a particular set of political beliefs, and these are beliefs that you hold on to very strongly, mm-hmm. you will carry these with you wherever you go. Doesn't matter mm-hmm. if you are, let's say, if you're moving from within one part of the Philippines or another, mm-hmm. but even if you leave the country generally. And so I would like to think that you will have Filipinos that if, let's say, you are of a liberal disposition, you will mm-hmm. find a more liberal party in your home country that you can identify with politically. Conversely, mm. if you are of a more conservative disposition in the Philippines, mm. and these are the political beliefs that you hold, you will try to find a political party in your host country that can appeal to your um, uh, conservative political sensibilities. Mm. And so this is an example of how politics in the home country influences your politics in the country where you are currently residing because you're trying to find a way to navigate the political system in the Mm. country that you've moved to using your political experiences that you um that you have gleaned in Mm. your country of origin now for subsequent generations of um the diaspora of course their politics will be much more influenced by the politics of their um of the country that they were born and raised in as opposed to their country of origin. But you do see the trend sometimes in the reverse. So you do have Filipino Americans, for example, wanting to express political opinions in the Philippines. And more often than not, these Mm. are political beliefs that may that may be to the left or to the right of um, first generation Filipinos um, in the diaspora and of Filipinos in the Philippines. So yeah. that's why you have discussions like the Philippine X issue, because it's like you have Filipinos in the Philippines saying, why on earth are Filipino Americans telling Filipinos in the Philippines how to speak their language and et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, that's an example of how politics and social social political developments mm-hmm. in countries like the United States and basically the developing world at large influence political goings on or social political goings on, if I may say, in their countries of origin. Okay, so we have here political values surviving different uh, environments. So yeah, I do agree with that one. Not only values per se, but also attitudes. I mean, uh, Filipinos who are critical of governments here 
maybe critical governments abroad, wherever their host country is. But uh, but yeah, I I think uh, one question, probably from your uh, comments on an alignment between political values that one got from one's home country to more or less uh, the political values circulating in your host country. But uh, going back to citizenship, do, do you feel a tension? Is there space for tension between your citizenship as a Filipino and your citizenship as an American? I think it depends. Um, hmm. I don't necessarily see this in the Filipino diaspora, but you do see this in the diaspora of other countries. So, for example, um, if you look at the Cubans and the Venezuelans, the Cubans and the Venezuelans in the United States, they escape communist dictatorships or socialist hmm. dictatorships in the case of Venezuela. And you can tell that a large chunk of of the Cuban and the Venezuelan diaspora in the United States vote for Republicans because Republicans can appeal to I hate Nicolas Maduro, I hate <laughs> Fidel Castro and Raul. And um, we are going to continue fighting for your in, um, for your interests. You know, we will be the party of free enterprise, the party of um, the party of capitalism, the party that will defeat um, the evil Cuban and, so, and Venezuelan socialists who are ruining your country, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you also have to recognize that this is implicit support of a party that also has damaging policies in um, at home. Mm-hmm. So if you think about it, the given that you have um, politics in your home country influencing the polit- um, your politics in your host country, Um, first-generation immigrants and recent immigrants, mind you, don't necessarily Mm -hmm. see how the politics of their home country also influences the politics of their host country based off of the party that they're voting for. Mm -hmm. Um, Because you do have um, people who are, and I hate to say this really, look, I don't think think voters are necessarily single-issue voters. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, you will have people who only vote for the Republicans because they are against abortion. You will have people only voting for the Democrats because the Democrats believe in social justice. But um, if you are informed, if you're if, so right, since we're running with the hypothesis that your politics in your home country influences the politics that you will have in your host country, more often than not, they tend to be like blinders that do mm-hmm. not allow us to recognize that because we are a single issue voter we are voting for political parties in our host country based off Mm. of their stances in our home country they do not realize how the policies of the um the party that they're voting for in their host country can also affect other things that are going on in their home country and that's why you do have second third fourth generation immigrants from those diasporas influencing the politics of older generation Mm. i remember watching a documentary from um current TV, this was 10 years ago, about um, Cuba. And you actually Mm -hmm. have a generation of younger Cubans who don't necessarily share the fervently anti-communist, pro-Republican political beliefs of their ancestors and believe that they actually can compromise with Fidel and Raul Castro, Mm -hmm. with the, um, the Cuban Communist Party, and that they can actually improve things, particularly politically, by engaging with them rather than shunning them all together with sanctions, which is what the Republicans want, right? So that's why I think it is also key for subsequent generations of the diaspora to continue influencing the the, the political inclinations of their elders because Mm. it allows their elders to see things from a more well-rounded perspective Mm. rather than having their host country politics be solely influenced by what's going on in their home countries, even though the host country's political party can't really do anything to influence politics in the home country. I'm, I'm curious about one thing, that one of the, well, our title is, like, why Philippine citizenship can endure, like, Philippine identity. So I'm, I want to ask you, like, as, a, as an immigrant, you know, and as someone who observes the Philippine diaspora, how does certain, say, Filipino political values still endure, or do they endure? Or are they in danger, in a sense? Because, uh, what do you think? I'm going to apologize to my Lolo for this. My Lolo will probably never listen to this podcast. Okay. Um, (laughs) Okay. Go ahead. No, but I can, I will tell you that a lot of Filipino Americans can probably relate to this. Mm -hmm. So a lot, um, from anecdotal evidence, my grandfather likes Trump. He is very Republican. Mm. He also voted for Duterte. So I don't know if it's one way or the other, but it does influence. um, There is a two-way exchange 
between politics in the home country and politics in the host country. Mm -hmm. So let's say you are predisposed to wanting to have a strong man in office in your home country. Mm -hmm. You are someone who supports having a quote-unquote leader who can impose discipline because your country is too disorganized and you mm -hmm. need um, more discipline to make your country better, right? Mm -hmm. This will also influence your politics in your host country where you will want a leader that can appeal to that. And particularly now where you have populist, particularly far-right populist movements sprouting all over the place, these are the very things that can appeal to segments of the population that are predisposed to wanting to have a strong man in power. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that the Filipino-American diaspora who may have voted for Duterte will want a dictator in their home countries. I certainly hope that Filipino-Americans and Filipinos in the diaspora more generally are going to be more pragmatic with who they vote for um, mm -hmm. in their host countries as opposed to necessarily who they vote for in the Philippines. And I'm not going to be in a position to influence that simply because mm -hmm. I am but one person. But I certainly hope, um, and I certainly do think, based off of what I have seen, that you will see people um, whose political beliefs in the Philippines, that they've learned in the Philippines, endure. So, like, as I mentioned earlier, Duterte was one, I bet you. The Marcos hmm. loyalists in the United States, of which there are, and then <laughs> there are Marcos loyalists in the United States, I bet you some of them probably voted for Trump. That's okay. not a secret. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so I think uh, based on your last few statements regarding uh, Filipinos trying to think or Filipinos as diaspora trying to uh, be more uh, rational with their vote. So you know, in, in general, what can Filipinos abroad do more for Filipino politics? So I like to think that Filipino Americans have to continue to be more active in encouraging responsible citizenship among mm -hmm. the diaspora. Um, and not just Filipino Americans, Filipinos in the diaspora more generally. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, um, the Kamalek has lamented how Filipinos in the diaspora don't vote. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it's also partially because it's difficult to vote anyway. Look, if it was like the United States where you can download the ballot and then mail it back, of course you're going to have more people voting. Rather <laughs> than, oh, you have to go to the consulate or the yep. embassy <laughs> and it's so far away. And you know that a lot of Filipinos are not privileged the way we are um, and that they will have to take time off of work and they will have to deal with no pain or to cast the ballot or to drop their ballot off at the consulate or the embassy for mm -hmm. it to be sent back to the Philippines and reflected in the counts accordingly. Mm -hmm. So I, will, I certainly hope that um, Filipinos will continue to um, foster responsible citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that this is something that all Filipinos in the diaspora, not just first-generation Filipino Americans or first-generation um, Filipinos in the diaspora, are necessarily responsible for. Mm -hmm. um, but I also do think that it is, on, uh, it is imperative on the part of Filipinos in the diaspora to continue to inform themselves of what is going on in the Philippines. And what I mean, what I mean by inform, Please, not just Facebook and um to, and uh, Viber messages being passed around. <laughs> Actually watch the news and read the papers. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm serious. Because you do have Filipinos in the diaspora who believe anything that they read, right? Anything that they read from a source that is not particularly accurate. And so I certainly encourage Filipinos in the diaspora, if you're going to be responsible citizens in your host countries, at the very least, you can also afford to be responsible citizens in your home countries. It's not like we're encouraging people to be responsible citizens every day. At the very least, exercise mm. your right to vote every three years and do so responsibly, right? Yeah. And again, as you said, it's really difficult <laughs> to try to get the voter's ID abroad. You just need to go to consulate themselves. Oh, yeah. it's not just the voter's ID. It's registering generally. Yeah. So, for example, here... To re I'm registered. I'm registered mm. to vote at the Philippine Consulate General in LA. And so I am mm. able to vote there. And what they do is they send me the ballot. And yeah. then I mail the ballot back. Or I drop it off at the consulate, which is easy enough for us. But mm. in other countries, um, or at other diplomatic missions outside of, uh, in this case, yeah. my diplomatic mission, you will mm. have people like, you want to cast the ballot to vote? You must physically show up to the embassy or consulate mm. to cast your ballot. And if, yep. let's say, the, like here, for example, um, I'm currently in Madrid. During the time that the Philippine Consulate General in Barcelona, Barcelona from Madrid is 600 kilometers away, okay? Mm -hmm. So during the time that 
the Philippine consulate in Barcelona was closing, Filipinos in Barcelona and in Catalonia in general were complaining to the Philippine government. So they mm-hmm. were complaining to Noy Noy at the time because it was his administration that ordered the consulate to close. They were complaining that, you know, I I do not want to have, oh, I'm sorry, it's 300 kilometers, not 600 kilometers. They were complaining to him that, you know, I, we can't afford to go 300 kilometers to Madrid in order to be, uh, <laughs> in order to avail of consular services. It's just too far for mm-hmm. us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I certainly commiserate with the fact that people have difficulty um, reaching consular services, particularly because the Philippine um, diplomatic network is not as wide as we would mm-hmm. like it to be. We are still only expanding the service very slowly mm-hmm. compared to where we were in 2010 when it was at mm-hmm. its peak mm-hmm. um, after Gloria Macapagal Arroyo left office. Um, so let us see what happens with um, people being able to vote. But if you are going to make it easier for people to vote, if you're able mm-hmm. to offer online voting options, mm-hmm. you're able to actually mail ballots to people, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you are encouraging people to be responsible citizens on the part of government mm-hmm. um, in order for them to actually exercise their political rights in the Philippines, which Philippine government officials have said, we want the diaspora to be active in Philippine politics. Mm-hmm. Then by all means, they should be able to do just that. I mean, it's not... Look, we're short of... um, And other countries have done this. France does this. North Macedonia does this. um, A number of other countries in Europe do this. Mm. They have... um, They actually have seats reserved for the diaspora in their parliament. We should have that in the Philippines. Mm, Yeah, quite literally. The the diaspora will... But only if they meet a certain threshold. So the uh-huh. threshold is low enough that they normally don't seat representatives, but if the threshold is high enough, and I imagine if we continue to encourage responsible citizenship among Filipinos, mm. the threshold can be met that we will actually mm. have Filipinos in the diaspora um, who are able to participate in political life. The other thing that I would advocate for, in fact, is the reversal of the Supreme Court decision that basically says dual citizens are not allowed to run for absolutely any political office. Mm -hmm. I am perfectly fine with lifting that restriction for local government offices down. Mm -hmm. If you you want to become a member of Congress, you want to become a senator, you want to become president, then you have to renounce. That's Mm -hmm. perfectly fine. But if you're just going to be governor or mayor or heck, barangay captain or barangay tanod or barangay... (laughs) um, or um, Kagawad, or even SK chair or SK board member, ha? you mm. have to renounce. Mm. Are you really going to renounce your citizenship for such a low position? Of course not. Especially if you're coming from a very privileged country like the United States. Mm. Mm. Fair. I think that's a, that's a compromise that uh, mm-hmm. I can uh, admit. <laughs> but yes. Uh, just a few more questions before we wrap this up. You know, this has been very educational half hour, mm. but uh, I was wondering uh, if there's anything else you'd want to say about, uh, I want you to perhaps address two kinds of people who, who might be listening right now. Number one, what do you want to say to Phil Ams like Andre and like yourself, you know, uh, and what what needs to be done further as dual citizens, you know, or as uh, Filipinos in a diaspora? And number two, perhaps if you can address Filipinos here, you know, and perhaps say something um, um, that can help them understand the diaspora better, you know? What can you say to the people who may even doubt or even resent the diaspora, you know, say that they're traitors, which I know you're aware there's some. So, yeah, what do you think to these two uh, types of people? uh, I will get to your second point in a bit because I have very strong opinions with regards to Filipino foreigners being called traitors, especially in light of what (laughs) happened in ABS-CBN last year. Um, But with regards to the first point, you know, to encourage Andre and other Filipinos in the diaspora, I do think that it is imperative on the part of all Filipinos in the diaspora, not just first-generation Filipino immigrants, because we are only but a smaller subset of Filipinos in general, it is Mm -hmm. our responsibility to build the nation even if we are outside of the Philippines. Just because you live in the United States and quote-unquote the U.S. is your home, doesn't mean that you have, that you abnegate your responsibility to help build your home country anyway, because you actually do have the opportunity to build your country of origin and to leave an indelible mark on it through whatever um, it is that you do. And so I would encourage particularly Filipinos in the diaspora to continue to be politically active, 
to continue speaking out about things that are going on in the Philippines, to continue encouraging um, Filipino Americans to become dual citizens um, and to vote and to exercise your political rights and particularly to explore your Filipino heritage and what it means to be Filipino. I actually do appreciate you have a lot of Filipino Americans and Filipinos in the diaspora generally who want to, and if they're able to, who want to reacquire Filipino citizenship, who actually want to um, es- explore their roots as Filipinos and to really reaffirm and reestablish those ties between the motherland and their country, um, their host countries. And so I think that that is a particularly admirable thing to do with regards to the diaspora wanting to reconnect with goings on back home. But with regards to the second subset of people, so Filipinos in the Philippines, I certainly hope that Filipinos in the Philippines understand that Filipinos in the diaspora are not detached from goings on in the Philippines. We are affected by what's going on in the Philippines as well. Why do you think so many Filipino Americans complained, and not just Filipino Americans, Filipinos in the diaspora, they complained when in April last year, PhilHealth wanted to impose premiums on Filipinos living abroad, even though we don't take advantage of the Philippine public health care system, nor can we, right? Because we are abroad. So you can't have it both ways where you say, oh, if any, if um, if Gabby Lopez wants to continue owning ABS CBN, he should renounce his US citizenship and just be a Filipino citizen. And then at the same time say, oh, Filipinos, um, Filipino Americans are also Filipino. You can't have it both ways, right? You can't say um, you are not allowed to own business interests in the Philippines if you're a dual citizen. Yet at the same time, you're going to extol um, a Filipino foreigner who may not necessarily feel Filipino as an exemplar of Filipino achievement simply because, you know, um, they have a Filipino mother and you want to express Pinoy pride, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I certainly hope that Filipinos in the Philippines understand that if you are going to want to have Filipinos who are going to be active in our politics, that, that comes with the package of wanting to treat Filipino foreigners as your own. In mm. that you can't just have um you can't just be proud of our achievements, but then abhor the politics that they may have. You have to embrace mm. the diaspora for what it is, warts and all. Mm. Um, and I certainly hope that Filipinos um in the Philippines understand and recognize that Filipinos in the diaspora do have things that they can contribute to to help make the Philippines a better place. And I can tell you now. A lot of the Filipino foreigners want to improve the Philippines. They want the Philippines to be a better country than it is. And they will want to go home in order to do precisely that. Mm. And I certainly hope that we will continue to welcome them with open arms and that they will be given the chance to show their worth and to prove that my Filipino-ness, even though I spent my entire life abroad, my Filipino-ness um, is not dependent on what you may think, but it is dependent on the results that I can produce and I can show you that I am capable of contributing to the well-being of the Philippines based off of what I can do. Mm. Wow. And that itself is a pragmatic value that is inherent in Filipino culture. We are we are a very pragmatic society as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, that, that's great. Anything else, Borge, before we uh, wrap this up? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Well, thank you, Josh. That was a very good address to both sets of uh, Filipinos. Very fair and very inspirational. Thank you very much. Uh, Now let's move on to our final segment, which is recommendations. Where we recommend supplementary materials, you can uh, movies, songs, or even books or whatever uh, that can help further our knowledge of this discussion we had today. So, uh, as guest, can Josh, mm-hmm. do you have anything to recommend for our listeners? So, I actually have been doing a long time history project. Matt, I mm-hmm. think you're aware of this because I started this mm-hmm. while I was still in the Philippines. I was looking at the languages spoken by presidents mm-hmm. of the Philippines. And so I actually oh, encountered okay. the book, that, mm-hmm. right? Um, I finally published the article for Wikipedia like a few weeks ago. Um, mm-hmm. Or no, I published it in May. 
So about a month or so ago. Um, and so there is a book that I've seen previews of because I'm able to do so through mm. um, in order to build the resources for that article that I actually want to read. And it's an article called How to Hide an Empire. Sorry, it's not an article, it's a book. It's How to Hide an Empire, A History of the Greater United States by Daniel Emmerwar. And so mm. it actually tells you about how the United States built its overseas empire and the people that um, um, the people who have been um, subjugated and hurt along the way. So, for example, it was from here that I learned, contrary to the, his depiction in El Presidente in 2012, hmm. yeah. um, Emilio Aguinaldo actually never learned English. I and mean, he <laughs> resisted so much so that he died in 1964 never learning it. Um, oh. So this tells you the history of um, American imperialism from hmm. the Filipinos, from the Puerto Ricans, from the other peoples who have lived through it. Um, and so this is something I am trying to read. I certainly hope I'll be able to get a copy of a book my, of the book myself. And I certainly look forward to recommending it to anyone who may be able to get the book. Interesting. Anyway. Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, Borch? Mm -hmm. mm. uh, for my case, uh, I'll recommend, um, well, it's a movie, uh, mm -hmm. really old movie. Uh, title is uh, Lenin. Oh, the wow. train. So it's, been, there's a, it's, it's a short movie. Uh, ben Kingsley, I think, plays Lenin. No, oh. there are there there are two good Lenin actors. You have Patrick Stewart and Ben Kingsley. So Ben Kingsley is in this one. Both are great. Yep. So uh, it's the story of uh, Lenin's uh, exit from his exile in Switzerland. So the the price that he must pay, the the risks that he took uh, to go back to Russia, because he uh, again he was sponsored by uh, the Germans, German Empire. So uh, mm. they allowed him a train that would transport him back to Russia. But I think one of the main character, one of the characters there was the mediator between Lenin and the Germans, uh, which was, uh, I think, the, Dr. Helphand. Uh, Dr. Helphand was the, uh, mm. he's a businessman who was a former socialist. So he had contacts with German industrialists, German militarists, and contacts with the revolutionary movement. So he tried to help the revolution and tried to help Germany by, mm. again, the, the transporting Lenin back to Russia so that they can stop uh, the involvement of Russia from the First World War. That was the plan. So you have Dr. Helpen's character there as a, uh, a controversial one. Uh -huh. Also Lenin's decision-making process on whether or not the, he should <laughs> agree to the uh, proposal. And of course he did. That's why he was uh -huh. uh, transported back to Russia in mm -hmm. secret. Right. It's about the return of a great man in order to change that history forever, despite coming from abroad, right? Yeah, th technically, the, his history, the history of Russia was already changing. He wants to control it. He wants to influence uh -huh. it. So the revolution already happened and he was... <laughs> He would uh, risk arm and limb just to be a part of that revolution. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Definitely a parallelism we might hope for the diaspora. And uh, my recommendation is something very recent, actually. And it's, uh, I think, and it's easily accessible in Netflix. It's called Yellow Rose, uh, starring e Eva Noblezada, and I think featuring great actresses like Princess Punzalan and mm. Lea Salonga. Uh, basically, it's about uh, this mother and daughter uh, pair. Uh, who was living in Texas. That's why it's called Yellow Rose, Yellow Rose of Texas. And they're basically just living their life as Princess Punzalan plays actually a domestic helper, I think a maid in a motel of all things. Not even a family hotel, it's the motel. And eventually she was caught as an illegal immigrant. And so now it's she let, um, uh, Evan Nablisada's character, she is left to uh, fend for herself and eventually becomes a country singer. She... Yeah, she sings in a bar, I think. And so I think that one thing that connects the country together, I think, is music. Hmm. And, and there are two very important scenes where, number one, she sings in Tagalog, especially a lullaby sung by her mother. And, of course, sung by Lea Salonga. And then the other one is, of course, eventually, that uh, sing uh, she translated that singing into her songs in country, you know? So th she sings both in both languages and thus... Uh, contributes in a way to both the cultures, and that and that's a beautiful thing. It's a very simple film, it's not a, it's ve not very not too extravagant. Just a very simple film, mm. but it actually portrays the struggles of an Im Filipino immigrant family in the diaspora. So, I, I highly recommend anyone who has the time to watch it. You know, so yeah, that is a great episode. I think it helped yep. us be more Filipino. I just noticed that it's, we can call this a belated July 4 episode, <laughs> uh, which is important to both uh, countries as independents. Um, 
So, uh, Josh, before you leave, do you have anything to promote? Or where can they reach you if they want to find you? So, you can reach me at Akistar, A-K-I-E-S-T-A-R. Mm-hmm. That's me on almost all social media, um, including DeviantArt, if you're ever so artistically inclined. Um, I am trying to rebuild my website. My website is currently joshlim.me. I'm trying to eventually move on to joshlim.com now that I have the mm-hmm. domain. Um, I haven't done that yet, but I certainly look forward to rebuilding that. If you are on Wikipedia, I am user Sky Harbor. Mm-hmm. Um, two words. So feel free to find me there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you ever want to reach me, you can email me at jamesjoshualim at gmail.com or simpler, josh at joshlim.me. And I look forward to hearing from you folks. Thank you so much, Matt and Borge, for having me here. Yep. Thank you, Josh, and right, for so sharing. Much. Of not only your knowledge but also your personal experience you know it's very inspirational so um yeah the pi podcast can be found on spotify anchor youtube and if you have any comments messages or ep- uh, ideas for episodes you may message us on facebook or uh give us an email at pi podcast ph at gmail.com but until the next episode magandang gabi mga pi